Hi, everyone. We're super excited that you're able to join us today for this uh, community or oh, staff conversations um, with the district. Uh, we want to first start with some housekeeping. Um, if you need uh, Spanish interpretation, that is available for you. Um, I'm going to actually let our Spanish interpreter also translate that. Hold on, I was in mute. Buenas tardes a todos. Bienvenidos a, a todos ustedes por estar aquí en las conversaciones con la comunidad. Les vamos a recordar que aquellas personas que prefieren escuchar esta presentación en español, por favor, escojan su idioma en el globito que se encuentra en la parte de abajo de la pantalla y escojan el idioma inglés o español de acuerdo con su preferencia. Muchas gracias. <laughs> Muchas Sorry. gracias. Yeah. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Um, for those who also um, need ASL interpreting, we have those available. Um, if you'd like, you can actually go to the participant. Um, they will have labeled their name ASL1 and ASL2. There should be three dots on the right-hand side corner where you can select and you can be able to um, pin them. Um, and that will allow you to see them throughout this conversation. Um, my name is Carla Rivera and I'm a community engagement coordinator with AISD and the Department of Community Engagement. So we're really happy to be able to be here with all of you to create a space of community um, to be able to interact with our vertical teams. Um, we have some anticipated topics um, that we are going to address this afternoon, um, but please feel free to send us some questions um, in the chat. Um, as well as raising your hand. Throughout this um, discussion, we will be having some Q&A um, in between, so you could definitely open up uh, for questions or concerns during that time. Um, now I would like to get started and introduce the panel that we have this evening, starting with our superintendent. Good afternoon, everyone. Stephanie Elizalde, very humble to serve as superintendent. And welcome to our uh, hopefully one of several community conversations as we begin to build this in as part of our regular routine. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Elise Alde. Next up, we have our Chief Academic Officer. Hi, everyone. Elizabeth Casas, Chief Academic Officer. Welcome. It's great to see you this afternoon. Our Chief of Schools. He was having some uh, technical difficulties. He sent me a text. He's logging off and logging back on. So we can come back to Dr. Mays in a moment. Okay, gotcha. So, um, well, this is a picture of our panelists. So Dr. Mays is featured here. Um, so while we wait for him to come, um, let's move on with our equity officer. Good evening, everyone. And thank you for being here. Stephanie Hawley, equity officer, and looking forward to the conversation. Next up, we have our Chief Technology Officer. Good evening, everyone. Sean Brinkman, Chief Technology Officer. Glad you're with us this evening. Our Chief of Police. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Ashley Gonzalez, Chief of Police. Uh, excited to be here. Then we have our Chief Human Capital Officer. Lovely Stevens, happy to be here and our Chief Officer of Intergovernmental Relations and Board Services. Hello everyone, my name is Jacob Reach, the Chief Officer for Intergovernmental Inter Relations and Board Services. I'm very excited to be here with our Eastside Garza and international communities. Thank you. Next up, we have our Executive Director of Innovation and Development. Hi everyone, Michelle Wallace. Thanks for making time this evening. Our Chief Operations Officer. Hello everyone, my name is Matias Cigarette. I am the Acting Chief of Operations and thank you for having us. Thank you. And last but not least, our new Chief Communications and Community Engagement Officer. Hi, my name is Jason Stanford and for the last 10 days, I have been your Chief Communications and Community Engagement Officer. Looking forward to the next 10 and this evening especially. Thank you everyone for giving their introduction. Um, we're gonna be moving forward with talking about 
uh, kind of like what's on everyone's mind. And I'm sure that one of those that is graduation. So Dr. Mays, can you, I don't know if he's here with us now. I oh, am I see here. you. Awesome. <laughs> so glad that you can join us. Um, we want to go ahead and then ask you this question, you know, can you tell us a little bit about what the end of the year is going to look like? Sure. So again, we're excited to, to share that we will be hosting uh, an actual face-to-face -face graduation. Uh, of course, we're modifying our graduation just to try to maintain safety uh, protocols. And so we'll be doing that outside uh, on our out, at our outdoor stadiums. And so that will be May 28th through June 3rd. Uh, and again, we'll have plenty of safety protocols in place, checking temperatures, providing screenings, each graduate will be able to bring four guests so that we can maintain social distancing. Um, and again, we're excited about that. We also will be hosting uh, our proms to, again, to try to make sure that each and every one of our seniors gets the chance to participate in those rites of passage that uh, the seniors typically get to participate in. And so that will be a combination of indoor and outdoor uh, opportunities for students to kind of mingle, but we're encouraging them to stay with their date uh, because students will be able to bring a, a guest or a date to those events. And so we're excited about hosting these events. We're excited about uh, our seniors getting a chance to, uh, again, participate in those rites of passage as they finish up with us. Well, thank you so much for that information, Dr. Mays. I'm sure our students and our families are going to be so excited to be able to have these opportunities to be able to have graduation and prom, like you said. So that's really awesome to hear. Um, Dr. Elisalde, we are looking now at what it seems like to the end of the tunnel of this pandemic. Um, so I'm sure folks are thinking about what's going to happen next year and kind of talking a little bit of what are preparations. So can you talk a little bit about that? Thank you so much for that. Yes, next year will look much, much more like a traditional school year. Um, we will probably still have some masks, but we know now uh, definitively that um, three feet distancing, which is very possible in our classrooms, um, the six feet, as you all know, is very challenging in some classrooms. Um, so the three feet, which we have been following because we've been utilizing the, um, and I'm going to get the official name wrong, but it's an association of the um, American Pediatrics Group. And um, that group have done studies and showed that three feet was, was sufficient, uh, along with masking. So not just the three feet, but the three feet plus the masking. Um, we're very excited to have been able to offer so many uh, opportunities for vaccines because, you know, one of the things that I've discovered here in Austin is how much our community loves and cares about its staff members. The biggest overwhelming concern that I heard from our community, from our parents, um, was the concern for the adults in the building because they, as adults, we have been more um, susceptible to the negative, much more negative effects of COVID. And so many of the parents were saying, it's not our children. Um, you know, we recognize that, the, that the, the risk is very low to children. They said, we're worried about our teachers. We're worried about our cafeteria workers. We're worried about our custodians. We're worried about our campus leaders. And so it's, it's, very, it's, it's certainly very refreshing to hear a group that is very concerned with the health and safety of the staff. And so they have now also indicated um, some sense of relief that so many of our staff have received vaccines that they now feel more comfortable, as is evidenced by the fact that we have had increases in the students that are attending now in person. So next year will absolutely look much more like a traditional school year with more traditional types of activities and interactions. We have learned so much about this virus and, um, and we've learned how to continue to stay safe. I do want to iterate, our schools have been safe. They have been safe from day one because of the work of our staff. And where we have had concerns have come from in almost 100% of our instances is Unfortunately, there was someone who did not practice the protocols, and, and that is where we see some of the spread. So next year will look much more like a traditional school year, and our team is also considering a type of um, virtual instructional model. Much of that 
uh, the reason we can't describe to you what that looks like is because, surprise, surprise to those of you who have been in Texas education, the TEA has not given us all of the rules about what that would look, need to look like in order to qualify for funding. And so we know that we will have some very limited students who may have uh, a medical reason that it might be best for them to be served uh, in a virtual setting, but still want to attend Austin ISD. And so we're working to have that as a possibility. Uh, and just one last thing is, is as a reminder, um, because I think there's been also a little conversation about this, the, there is one six weeks that we have, y'all have heard about hold harmless. And in this hold harmless, that means that we wouldn't be penalized for student attendance like you typically would be during any other school year. Um, first and second six weeks were automatic. No matter who you were, no matter who showed up, you automatically gained the hold harmless funding for the first and second six weeks. The third six weeks, you had to have offered instruction every single day for in-person for the entire third six weeks. We did not do that. You may recall that during the Thanksgiving holidays when we returned, I did suspend in-person instruction. That violated the TEA expectation or rule, and therefore uh, it did put us in, in somewhat of a financial crunch. I'm not sorry we did that. It was the right thing to do at that time. For the fourth, fifth, and sixth six weeks, there was some misinformation out by the media that said we had to hit 43.6 to gain fourth, fifth, and sixth six weeks funding or, or to be held harmless, if you will. Again, back to the attendance issue. That is not true. For the fourth, fifth, and sixth six weeks, we simply have to maintain the 23.6 in person minimum that we had in October. So then, well, where is the concern? The concern is that third six weeks, that's roughly between five and six million dollars. If we don't hit, so what do we need to do in order to get credit for that held harmless? That's where we have to hit 20 points above the 23.6 October PEANS in-person report. That means we have to hit 43.6% of in-person attendance for a significant number of days during the six, six weeks. In order, I know it sounds weird, during the six, six weeks, we have to meet this mark in order to regain the hold harmless funding for the third six weeks. So um, we, we have seen so many of our uh, students returning. We are up to, I think, nearly 34% up from the 23.6%. And we would love to encourage more of our students to attend. Certainly it has an impact on funding, but let me be clear. No amount of money would have me risk our students returning in person. No amount of money. We do know that there are significant mental, social, emotional skills and needs that our students have that cannot be met over Zoom. And, and there's, no, there's no way to replace you as a staff member. Um, and so because of that, we absolutely are welcoming our students back. We know you want to welcome them back because that's what you signed up for. You want to interact with students. So we thank you for that. And I hope we've given a little bit of of clarity to some of the misinformation, but I do have to say, I would be remiss, I see one of our finalist teacher of the years taking time to join us this evening. Uh, Dr. James is joining us and I had the pleasure, if I look tired, I am tired because yesterday I got to go to four schools to celebrate teacher of the year finalists. And Dr. James from Eastside Memorial High, Early College High School, Congratulations. Maybe you can turn on your camera for just a moment, sir, so that everyone can see Dr. James and we're super excited. There he is. Thank you, sir, for joining us. Thank you Thank so you. very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Elizalde. And again, congratulations. Very happy for you, Dr. James. Um, and thank you so much. I feel like a lot of families know that the fact that we are giving our staff a vaccine opportunity and we are looking at hybrid models is something that we are definitely gonna be looking forward to in this new upcoming uh, school year. Um, so right now I wanna be able to give the time to our staff members and if we have community members here with us too, to let us know your questions. So if you wanna go ahead and put that in the chat, I do see one question. 
already so i'm going to address that one but if you want to raise your hand um please feel free this is a space where you can be able to really address your questions and concerns so our first question is what plans does the district have to support our school's attendance in the emvt which i'm assuming it's the east side vertical team specifically how will we urgently look into and truly affordable housing to slow down the amount of families being priced out of our attendance zone, causing drops in enrollment at our schools? And I can open it up to whoever wants to answer that question. Sure. Let me get started. And then I'm going to turn it over to our uh, chief operations officer, uh, Mr. Segura. Um, let me start off by saying, um, you know, even our, our, our Saturday um, Operation Reconnect revealed um, a, a lot of information. We'll be doing those in other communities, including the East Side Memorial a Vertical Team of Families. Um, and, and so what we've discovered is two things. There is absolutely an opportunity for us to look into whether people think, you know, there's, there's folks on all sides and there's some folks that say that's not a school responsibility. Well, we don't see it that way. We do see it as an opportunity for us to partner with our community and rather than just saying we partner with the community, actually do something. So I know our operations officer has already embarked on a plan and is looking into what that affordable housing um, can look like, um, evaluating some of our current properties that are not being utilized. Instead of trying to sell them and, and get dollars, uh, we wanna see how we can invest that particular property. Um, but before I go from there, I think the question also, um, requires us to pick up a mirror collectively and recognize that's not the only reason that our students are not attending our schools. Uh, I would be using that as an excuse if I said that was the issue. Um, what we have to recognize is there are 16,000 students, many of which are in East Austin, that live in Austin ISD and are choosing not to attend Austin ISD schools. And so that means we have to work with our staff and our community to provide our staff and our schools the support and resources that are necessary so that the conditions that may have affected some parents not choosing our schools, that we can re-engage with our families. Uh, Mr. Segura? Thank you, Dr. Lizalde. Uh, certainly all of that work that you described is um, very exciting and uh, we're very much appreciative of being a part of it. Uh, specifically uh, regarding affordable housing and looking at opportunities, uh, AISD is, is very well positioned to have a meaningful role in our community and identify these sorts of opportunities. As Dr. Alizali mentioned, we are starting a robust, um, comprehensive process, which is going to include engagement with the community, um, identifying uh, potential solutions and testing the solutions to really um, create community benefit. Uh, it's an exciting process. It's going to take some time, uh, you know, but we're really trying to figure out how we can um, partner in a meaningful way and, and try to keep as many of those families uh, within AISD. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Elizalde and Mr. Segura for that information. Um, we do have another question, so I want to briefly just address that before we move on to our next section. Um, it is by our Teacher of the Year from Eastside. He is asking, um, will there be any opportunity for students um, to utilize any vaccine, uh, any vaccination openings? Many students and families continue to experience some problems with trying to access sites and its registration process. So can we talk a little bit briefly about that? Sure, I can start with that. And I think Dr. Reach is on too. So we've already began to try to identify partners to make these opportunities available for our students. Um, we actually uh, spoke yesterday and have uh, one opportunity lined up. I think Dr. Reach is on the call because we do have a campus, I believe, slated, but we are actively uh, looking for and seeking opportunities to partner with um, individuals that have, provide vaccinations for our students and trying to make sure that we can get those uh, placed on campus sites to uh, meet the needs of students. Yeah, I, I would just add to that, that we are doing uh, one of our first uh, vaccination clinics at a high school this Saturday. 
We're very hopeful that this is going to be successful. And according to our previous conversations with the group that's actually providing the vaccines, we think it's uh, something that we're going to be able to replicate at other campuses. So that's going to be at Navarro this Saturday, and we hope you get more information about that later. And we're really looking forward to uh, replicating it at other campuses. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Reach. Um, I just want to let everyone know that we are in switching interpreters. So we are now moving to our a ASL interpreter too. Um, so I'm, I'm sure a lot of people have questions about budget, right? We are facing some budgetary challenges, um, you know, especially associated with COVID-19 and just the unexpected um, issues that we've had. So Ms. Stevens, can you briefly talk about what that looks like? Um, yes, so what we look at is a year ago, the district was projected to have 80,000 students. And this current school year, we have approximately 75,000 students. So that is a reduction of 5,000 students. We are projected for next year to have a little over 77,000 students. So we're still, a, we're still below the 80,000 we were projected for for this year. So when we look at our staffing guidelines that are used in the district, that had been used the previous year, if we would have just applied those same staffing guidelines to the projected enrollment for next year, we'd have reduced about 600 campus level positions. So it gave us an opportunity to rethink the way we do our staffing guidelines. And so we looked at, you know, just, and we knew just by looking at some of the staffing that there were some inequities across the district in terms of what, what schools had in terms of staff. So we thought it was a good opportunity that we could reset the district and apply the same formulas across the board and apply some some weighting within our formulas to provide some equity across our staffing guidelines. And so we did do that for um, the number of special education students on a campus to two positions. That would be the counselor position and the AP positions so that we could accommodate just the requirements, legal requirements we know with that, that go with that um, position. And then the other one we waited for was for economically disadvantaged. And we actually took the numbers in October and applied those to the waiting formulas. So we have basically reset the whole district to the same one. And what that did was when we reset it and we reduced the high school one from 29 to 28. And when we reset it, what we've got is approximately between 200 and 250 position reduction on the campus level. And so what happens there is, um, the campuses identify those personnel. They will be in our priority placement pool. And, and as we have attrition in the district, whether it is people that resign, retire, move out of the area for whatever reason, we will utilize our pool to fill those vacancies. So no one is losing their job over this. It's just that there's gonna be some shuffling around in terms of you know, where teachers are from one school to another. Awesome, thank you so much. So we do actually have a question um, that I wanted to be able to address. This comes from Lorelai who asked, what plans does the district have to retain current staff um, and create an experience for them in the, uh, this vertical team, Eastside vertical team? Okay, so what we do is when we have personnel in our priority pool, we, people will sit in that pool. So, at, so as life changes and things happen, we know right now that some of our campuses, I may be thinking in my head, oh, I'm going to be here next year and then something happens and I'm not. So we know that there are going to be resignations and retirements off of some of the campuses in the East Side Vertical Team. And as those occurs, if we have somebody in the priority pool who has the certification needs, then we will take them out of the priority pool for, you know, to remain back on their home campus 
or even within that vertical team. So we will not do any of the like placements just based on certification at a totally different school or a different even vertical team until later on in the in the summer. Okay, thank you for that. Um, this is kind of like an open-ended question, not specifically to budget. So I will open up to my panelists, whoever wants to answer this. Um, but is there any way to utilize student sharing any differently? Many students would attend their neighborhood schools if student, student sharing was offered. Our campuses lose students who attend, who attend schools that offer alternative programs. Um, and if you need more clarification, Dr. James, if you'd like to um, mute yourself to give us a little bit of clarification on that, we would appreciate it. Yeah, I, I, I only asked that question um, because student sharing has been something that the district has used in the past. I know we've had students from here at Eastside to go to different campuses to take certain courses, which is great. But I, I also noticed it appears to be a lessening of students actually using it. And, and I don't know what's the reason for that. Um, you know, it may be as simple as students don't, many students don't even know that here's a student sharing program. And so I find that to be a problem because students want to attend schools that, you know, in their neighborhood. But at the same time, I think it's significant that students are aware they can utilize resources that are available in the district. And yet we don't seem to use it. And so, for example, I'm here at Eastside, and we're not going to have an auto tech program at our new campus. Although many students want to take auto tech because it's a very good program, uh, it, it, the outcomes have been very good. So what do we do now? Are we going to be able to keep the students in Eastside, or are the students going to leave to go to a different school because they have an auto tech program? If the students are aware there's student sharing, we don't lose those students. They simply utilize the student sharing program. So I recognize that in terms of North and South and East and West, we all recognize that, but I'm not interested in hearing more about logistics, especially if we have something that students can utilize because I think it attracts more students and it keeps them not just in the neighborhood, but it keeps them in the district. And so my biggest concern is student sharing. Can we improve it? Is it still gonna be something we can use? And again, we're losing our auto tech program. Many students, he had a hundred and I think 30 freshmen taking auto tech. So what's gonna to happen to those hundred freshmen? Are they gonna leave and go to a different campus? I mean, just a simple question, so I appreciate it. I hope I cleared it up. Yes, you did, Dr. James, I appreciate it. Um, I'm gonna start off and then see if Dr. Mays wants to interject. I definitely think that um, that it's, uh, I'm, I'm not aware of what has occurred with the uh, student sharing component. Let me, let me say that first. I think that's definitely something that, um, we want to look into. I think there are a couple of different areas. One is we have an opportunity to utilize um, to utilize some virtual opportunities for some courses. I don't think it would actually apply to the example that you're giving right now, Dr. James, but definitely some courses that kids may be wanting that maybe we're like, oh, there's only six kids that want calculus, um, but there's a neighboring school that has it. The students can still remain and still take that course if we begin to really leverage the technology that we now have available to us. Um, with regard to other programming, we certainly started off by wanting our schedules to be the decisions being based on student need, not on, um, not on whatever programs have been there before, but rather how many students are interested in that particular program. But since this is specific to um, Eastside Memorial, I, I would welcome uh, Principal Garcia if you would like to help us with that, and, and if there are things that we need to be doing, then absolutely, we wanna be able to support that. Thank you, Dr. Lizalde. Thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. Absolutely, I, I do wanna answer that question and maybe clarify any uh, 
um, any questions that anybody might have. So yes, uh, so we are not gonna have an automotive program physically on the new site. However, we are working with Ms. Henry to utilize student sharing here in, uh, at Northeast High School. They do have a program. Uh, so definitely student sharing is uh, in our future plans uh, for the upcoming school years. And then uh, a lot of the automotive students uh, that started on that pathway, we did notify them last summer that it was going to be for an elective credit at that point. So yeah, there are 130 kids on there, but it, it went towards their elective credit for graduation. But uh, we had that discussion with uh, Ms. Henry and, and Mr. Magruder at, at Northeast to continue that student sharing. I hope that answered, clarified. Thank you so much um, for the question, Dr. James and Dr. Elias Alde and um, uh, Principal Garcia for providing that information. Um, there was a question uh, specifically um, that was retaining to budget. Um, so I apologize, I just had it a second ago, but I <laughs> moved up. Um, oh, I found it. So Laura Lai had some uh, clarification. She said that her question wasn't specifically related to this year's budget. It was more related to the general loss of staff and their experience from year to year. Um, so if you could briefly just explain that for us. Yes, um, that is within uh, human capital, we call that our retention strategies. Okay. And one of the big pieces we have is on our new district scorecard. There is a section directly related to uh, employee satisfaction on the employee survey and that leads to the retention of our employees because most employees, if they feel connected to their community, connected to their school, open welcome environment, then they will stay at that school because of their colleagues and because of the students and the communities they serve. So we will be focusing some of, a lot of our efforts in terms of that employee satisfaction with, with, their, with their job and with their, their role in the district. Um, the other piece that we know that it is, is the piece that was brought up earlier, I guess I'll say, is the whole issue of the cost of living within Austin. And once again, it goes back to like that longer term piece in terms of how, how can we in, in, in the district or even in human capital work to develop relationships to, you know, to potentially get some, you know, cost cost help with, with our employees on, on housing issues. So I know just some of the things that we can look at are things like apartment complexes that if you're an AISD employee, don't require you to put down the security deposit or those kind of things. And so we can build on that. We do have a couple, I know through our, if you go through our benefits app, there are a couple of apartment complexes that do that now but we could build that out. And those are things that we can upfront to employees because like I wouldn't know that existed until I'm an employee and I have my benefits and then I see it. But then you could also, we, it's just a marketing piece that we can assist on those kind of things. Thank you so much, Ms. Stevens. And so we're talking about students, right? And, and how we can support them. And so Dr. Elise Alde, can you briefly just tell us about how you worked with, you know, teachers and principals focus groups to help navigate that? Um, so, yeah, we've got two groups that I meet with um, throughout the school year. Um, they give up a lot of their time to bring me uh, feedback and suggestions, both uh, a teacher roundtable and a principal focus group. On the teacher roundtable, uh, as an example, um, meeting student needs, um, particularly uh, uh, teachers have really struggled with some of the technology applications that we've utilized in terms of, especially because we've used so much on Blend or Canvas and then grading and how do I get this to that. And some of it being able to be dictated, being able to make, meet the needs of the students if they need different types of modifications. Um, and they really brought to our attention that the tools that we have right now are really making their job much more difficult um, already on top of a very challenging, albeit rewarding, but very challenging job. And so this past, um, I think it was this week, um, our CTO, uh, Sean Brinkman, brought uh, a, a possibility and we 
or we were able to let teachers really see uh, the demo and then are gonna be able to give us feedback and ask questions so that once again, we can do a better job of meeting our students' needs through something that may seem very simple, but if we don't provide the right tools to our teachers, then they aren't able to meet the needs of our students. And so that's one example. Some other examples um, circled around um, how we will need a continuum of services with mental health for our students. And so just to illustrate that point as an example, you heard Ms. Stevens talk about as we're working on um, aligning our, our guidelines and staffing, well, we had a reduction in enrollment of students and even with a projected increase, we would still be below the 80,000 that this year's budget for the 2021 school year was built upon. Well, technically you would think then that that would also equate to a reduction of counselors. Well, in fact, we did the opposite. What we were able to do is by maintaining and keeping all of the counselors, we were actually able to lower the number of students to counselor ratio. Um, and so while we did reduce some of the um, teachers on campus in terms of a reflection of the enrollment on that, on that particular school, the counselors were an area that we were dedicated in maintaining because we wanted to actually have more counselors for the number of students that we have. And that's just one part. We're also realigning departments that may be working in silos so that we can actually bring them under one umbrella so that there will be a continuation of services because different students are needing access to different types of mental, social, emotional support. And so rather than just kind of making this campus based and it's all on a campus, we need to ensure that our central office supports are bringing uh, that continuum of services in. I don't know if Ms. Casas may want to um, add uh, with regard to that particular area that we heard from teachers and that was a response after hearing their feedback. Yeah, or organizationally, in addition to that, we are um, combining, condensing, and collapsing some of the functions to make sure that there's clarity about roles and responsibilities. We've bundled the licensed mental health professionals with our counseling team um, and put them in the same, um, under the same structure with our MTSS and SEL, CPNI group. Um, we really want to build this continuum of services so that campuses, as things come up, they know who do you contact? Do you contact somebody from the SEL? or do you contact a counselor or do you contact somebody from MTSS? So there'll be a lot of information on the clarity of roles and responsibilities so that we can make sure that we support the campuses as best we can. Thank you so much for all that information. Um, so as we continue, um, we kind of want to briefly talk about equity and the equity lens. So I'm going to open up to Dr. Holly, who's going to be um, talking about this portion. Dr. Holly, good evening. thank you. Good evening, it's good to, to be here with you all. I wanna give you a bit of an overview of what we're doing in terms of engaging our community. Um, we've set up an equity advisory committee uh, with, the number, with about 27 of our community internal and external folks. And you can see there from the diagram that we've got uh, a number of subcommittees and uh, those subcommittees are aligned with our board's priorities. And also at the very top of the diagram, you'll see community building and education. So we're working to do some healing with our community and to make sure they're at the table to help us with our equity work. We know there's a lot of wisdom in our community. Uh, also with the structure of the committee, we have uh, four uh, chairs, two are community members and two are uh, internal folks, and we have students and teachers and administrators, and we really welcome you all to join us. Uh, we'll, we have our next meeting on the 20th from 5.30 to 7.30. I think we just posted the agenda, but it's an opportunity to get involved, and a lot of people are interested in the equity assessment. Um, there's a subcommittee that will be working on that as well, and so just want to welcome all of you that are on the call today to just join us and uh, really get connected with our communities. And Dr. Elisalde, have I left anything out of that overview? I don't think so, Dr. Holly. I think maybe just re-emphasizing that um, you put that community building and education at the top of this flower petal blooming, as I like to call it, by design, because we know that it starts with our community. That you know, many of us may remember site-based decision making or site-based. 
um, management um, really became kind of like a, a buzzword um, back in the 90s. Um, the truth is site-based management has always, or site-based decision-making really does mean actually going and gathering feedback from our community, from those that are going to be most affected by the decisions that we make. And so this being the foundation of all of these subcommittees is really going to help us stay aligned um, to our mission, vision, values, and our, um, our priority focus areas. Thank you so much. Um, I just wanna let everyone know that we are switching interpreters. We will be switching to ASL one. Now I'd like to give the opportunity to our new chief of communications and community engagement officer to just kind of talk about community strategies as we look forward to this year and next year. Well, thank you. Um, again, my name is Jason Stanford and I'm the new Com chief of communications and community engagement for Austin ISD. I could not be more excited to take on this role. I started this job, like I said, 10 days ago, but I'm not new at all to Austin ISD. Uh, I'm not a staff, I haven't been a staffer, uh, but I am uh, an Austin ISD dad for the last 15 years. And over the last, those last 15 years, I've become a great admirer of what you do at, at Eastside. And in fact, I visited with the superintendent this week. Uh, you accomplished the impossible. It wasn't because of the inspiring work that Dr. James does. I saw the renderings for the new school and you actually made me want to go back to high school. Um, but in this role, I want to be helpful to you. Um, my background is in communications, not public education. The number one thing in communications is the audience. And I can already tell how we have not done a good job of communicating to staff. And that is going to be a huge priority of mine. Uh, now is the time uh, to give me your feedback uh, as I'm making plans to do exactly that. What would be helpful? How do you want us at the district to communicate with you at Eastside? Uh, I put my email address in the chat. I'll put my mobile number down there too. I really sincerely wanna hear from you and, uh, and work with you on this. My goal is for this school district to communicate with you in a transparent, frictionless, and friendly way. Communication is a two player game though. I can't do this without you. And I'm looking forward to getting your advice and feedback. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jason. And um, before we get uh, to the next section, I actually want to open up. We've had Eric Ramos, who's been patiently waiting uh, with his hands raised. So Mr. Ramos, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself, you can ask your question. Yeah, sorry, just like bouncing back a little bit. It's just, um, but I do want to get back to the issue of staff retention, because there was one thing, I know you did mention how like using um, the survey to see about the satisfaction of the staff. But the part that like, I feel like was missing from that was like, then what happens if, like you're right, if they're not satisfied, they're more likely to leave. So if we see that they're not satisfied in the past, what history has told us what happens, at least at the schools I'm involved in is either nothing is done until it's too late and we lose a lot of good staff or the district comes in and imposes its will on the campus thinking that they're gonna make the staff happy and that just makes us more unhappy and causes greater turnover. So how are we gonna address that through the staff to make them more happy without making more work for them or imposing things on them that they don't want just because they said they weren't happy with what was going on in that moment? Yeah, um, and I think that this is where we, we kind of cross paths with school leadership. Um, and and it is a, it's a leadership issue. Um, part of the role of being a campus leader, and it doesn't matter what the leadership position is, whether it's the principal, the AP counselor, all of that is to monitor and adjust for you know, employees on their campus. But it's also holding them accountable you know, for, for those actions and you know, activities and those kind of things on a campus. I, I don't know, I mean, I know that that doesn't, that doesn't like give you like a real specific answer, but it is working with our leadership on each of our campuses to identify where we have issues using the survey data, but using it in a productive way and using it where, you know, we can change climate and culture on every campus because that's part of our, our role on, on our campuses. And I don't know if Dr. Mays has anything he wants to add to climate and culture or even Dr. Elizalde, but it does start at the leadership level. 
Yeah, I, I completely agree, and that's what I was about to touch base on. Each one of our principals is responsible for pro providing and producing that culture and climate on the campus. Now, I will say this, that doesn't happen in isolation. The principal is, of course, the tip of the spear would drive in that culture, but it's a collaboration, the collaboration between the teachers, the assistant principals, you know, the community, all of those pieces factor into the culture and daily climate that's established on that campus. Uh, so it's really about that collaboration and working together uh, to make sure uh, that those that are at the campus uh, feel warm, feel welcome, feel invited, and feel a part of the, the daily work that we have to do within this district to meet the needs of our students. Um, you, you can email me offline and we can talk a little more because uh, I would definitely love to help support uh, you with areas where you see that we can make uh, you know improvements. Thank you so much, Dr. Mays and Ms. Stevens for answering that question. Um, we actually have a specific question for our new Chief of Communications and Community Engagement. Um, the question is, where is the communication of these successes of student sharing, lowering the ratio of, student, of students to counselors to the Spanish speaking community um, and not necessary like ads, um, like idea, but like genuine dialogue. Um, if you could like give us a brief um, uh, answer for that, we appreciate it. I am so glad you asked. Um, and I was telling you earlier today, so she already knows the answer. So <laughs> we're having this dialogue right now. And the way the school district and really any school district usually has these dialogues is in isolation. It only exists in this moment. But one thing we've all been incredibly good at over the last year is becoming Zoom TV stars, right? This is, think of this as a TV show, and we're having an honest dialogue about exactly what you're talking about. Now, what we can do, because we're recording this, we can take these answers and turn them into other stories that can live on our website and on social media, and we can get them out through our newsletters to the community. So this conversation is going to be amplified back to the community. So everyone's going to hear this, not just the people on the call. Now, obviously, on this conversation, we're going to be very specific about isolating that answer because I think that's, but otherwise, this is an open, uh, this is a private dialogue. But I think in that case, that's really good news that everyone needs to hear. And I think in turning community engagement events like this into communications, then we can have that, we can not just have that dialogue in an authentic way, but we can reflect it to the community as well. Thank you so much, Jason. We appreciate that. Sure. Um, so now we're going to move um, on to the um, strategic plan uh, framework that the board just adopted. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen for everyone. Um, you know, as we're looking at the next process in this administration and developing uh, targeted strategies, Ms. Wallace, can you provide us like with an overview of this framework that we're looking at? Sure, thank you. Um, again, Michelle Wallace, Office of Innovation and Development. And you may remember the Board of Trustees developed and approved our strategic framework um, last year. That includes our mission, vision, values, and priority focus areas. Um, and they were really specific that um, instead of making equity an additional focus area, they really wanted to see equity as the foundation of our strategic plan and of each priority focus area. So I wanted to make sure and point that out. Um, our priority focus areas you can see are student well-being and achievement, teacher and employee well-being, culture of respect, customer service, and fiscal stewardship and prioritization. The board also approved a scorecard, which is how we'll measure our success in those areas. And now the administration um, with Dr. Elizalde's leadership is working on developing strategies and action steps that will be, you know, what we're going to do to make progress in each of those focus areas. Um, all of that, uh, we're really fortunate to have a lot of resources with our equity office, the significant community engagement work that has happened throughout the last year um, was really deliberately kind of infused into this plan uh, to make sure it aligns with what we've heard from the community uh, through the great work of Dr. Holly and her team over the last year. Thank you so much for that. Um, Dr. Ali Salde, uh, would you like to kind of briefly talk about now that we have adopted this framework, what would be the next steps? 
yes, I would love to do that. The team's doing all the work, but it, I think there's one more slide that illustrates this connectivity. That there, Michelle, there we go, that Michelle was just talking about. Uh, our team had uh, a retreat. We got together on, I think it was a Monday. It seems so long ago. Um, but we, the team worked really diligently in working to create what you see towards the bottom on the right-hand side of this slide as the district improvement plan. Sometimes people will call it an action plan. Um, but essentially, um, the strategic framework then created or led to the creation, if you will, of a district scorecard. And I do want to mention that very uh very overtly that this is an Austin ISD scorecard. While it is absolutely utilized in my evaluation by the Board of Trustees, I have to recognize um, when we look at these outcomes, I absolutely have very little to do. It's the hard work that happens on campuses and the support from our departments that will get us these student outcomes. I don't forget that I teach absolutely zero students. I am not the one creating those wonderful opportunities for our students. Um, you all are that are, that are listening in um, and are participating here with us today. And thank you again for that. So from that scorecard, the question is, how are we gonna get there? How are we gonna reach these student outcomes? And that's through strategies and that's through our district improvement plan. But this improvement plan has to be based on the equity action plan which Dr. Holly and her team have worked on. Ultimately, this needs to reflect one plan, not that we would have different plans, but that we would utilize the equity action plan to inform our district improvement plan. Then we would reevaluate how we're doing. And this is kind of cyclical. We would continue to do this as we reach our goals, we will increase the outcomes and continue to make adjustments in areas where we don't reach those goals we'll have to make some adjustments to the strategies so that we can continue to reach those goals. Um, this is the foundation of our work. Um, it won't list every single thing that we're doing, obviously. It will talk about um, more of the big ideas and how that cascades down to the campus improvement plans and then where we provide support for our campuses. Thank you so much, Dr. Elise Holiday. We really appreciate that um, background on this framework. Um, as we're gearing up to our last portion of our Q&A, I want to be able to give Dr. Reach the opportunity to talk about a little bit, excuse me, um, to talk about enrollment. Dr. Reach? Sure, thank you so much. Yeah, so one of the other <clears throat> priorities that we do have for our district is looking at enrollment, something that we're calling Operation Reconnect. So I think everyone does know we have seen a steady decline in enrollment these past couple of years with a slight uptick two years ago, but then of course for this year a pretty large drop. Uh, drop. And so we uh, recognize that a lot of families uh, face uh, different hardships, different reasons for the decline in enrollment this year, but we really want to reprior we really want to prioritize reconnecting with all those families. Uh, I hope all of you saw the block walking and maybe some of you took part uh, just a couple of weekends ago where uh, staff was able to go out uh, to and knock on doors to talk about what's being offered at our neighborhood schools and our community and how much we want to see those families back into our schools next year. So please continue to watch out for uh, some of the upcoming events that we have coming around with our Operation Reconnect with of course a strong push for pre-K, but also sharing the great things happening. For instance, uh, not to not to call out just one school, but I'm going to, uh, like Eastside International moving to a brand new building. And what a great point we know that is to go out and show the community these amazing buildings that we have for our students and really connecting around that neighborhood um, to encouraging kids to come in. So we're very excited about this. Uh, as a matter of fact, we have started a enrollment office and I believe that uh, the first staff member starts in, in a week, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and they'll really be focused around improving our, form, our families' experiences, connecting them with our campuses, and helping them go through the registration process. Um, so very excited for this. And uh, please look out for more information coming. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Reach. So we do have a couple minutes. So if there's any last minute questions, um, you're more than welcome. I wanted to remind everyone that this meeting is recorded. So we will be updating it and putting it on our website for you to review. And as Jason said, we'll definitely be showing, showcasing this meeting through web stories. So definitely look out for that as well. Um, we really appreciate every single of one of our staff members for being with us, as well if we have any community members joining us. Um, but I don't see any questions remaining on this, uh, the chat. So we do really appreciate your time. We will be moving to a, our community uh, session right after this. So if you wanna join us then, um, you are more than welcome to, but we really appreciate everyone's time. So um, if not, you have, a, everyone have a good evening. Let, let me just, let me say one last thing because I, yeah. I don't wanna forget, I'm so sorry. First, I, I did also wanna recognize that uh, Mr. Eric Ramos also sits on our teacher roundtable, so I get to hear um, feedback from some of your schools. And then the other thing is that I want to take a moment to thank our interpreters. Sometimes we forget, and um, without them, um, we would not be able to communicate as well. And it's pretty hard, especially when each of us has a different cadence in which we speak. And some of us go really fast, and some of us go slow, but I appreciate everybody, uh, but particularly our interpreters, both our ASL and our bilingual um, interpreters. So thank you. And thank you to you for hosting us this evening. Thank you. See you guys soon. Bye.